My viewers ask awesome questions. In this video, I'm going to keep answering viewer questions on MS symptoms. Don't turn away, because that starts right now. Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. If you're impacted by MS and you want to up your game, please consider subscribing to the channel and ring the notifications bell so you don't miss any of my upcoming content. I love doing Ask Me Anything live streams where I answer your MS-related questions on the fly. I can't always get to every answer during the live stream, and so in this video, I'm answering archived viewers' questions about MS symptoms. It's actually the second part of a two-part series answering MS questions about symptoms. So if you haven't checked out the first video, I'll make sure to throw a link up above, and I'll include a link in the description down below. Let's jump in and answer some questions. Vanessa Dixon asks, can you speak on Botox and MS? Howdy, Vanessa. Thanks for the question. People with MS are at risk of suffering from spasticity, where opposing muscles argue with one another. And you can have tight limbs that are hard to bend. You can have painful, visible cramps and spasms where your arm or your leg bounces. In fact, upwards of 70% of people with MS may suffer from some degree of spasticity. The treatment for spasticity depends on where the problem is located. If you have a problem that involves both legs and your left arm, you're going to need a systemic therapy, either an oral pill or a baclofen pump, because you have to cover a lot of area. However, if you have spasticity mostly affecting a distal limb, like your hand, you don't want to take a pill that's going to be dissolved and dispersed through your entire body. You want something more focal. And that's where botulinum toxin comes in. Botox is a poison to the muscle. And if you gave too much, the muscle would stop working for three months, but we don't do that. We just give a little bit. We poison the muscle enough that it can relax and that the opposing muscles can work. One of the cool things about Botox is it only impacts where you inject. And so if you're injecting the arm, it's going to have no effect anywhere else in the body and it's going to have no effect systemically. I also like the fact that typically the results last for about three to four months. And so once you dial in the right amount of Botox in the right location, it's simply a matter of repeating the procedure every three to four months. And in the meantime, no pills and no other shots. Botox can be very helpful. If you have spasticity, please talk to your MS provider, and they can help you sort out if Botox is right for you. Ms. Perullo writes, Glad you mentioned down there. My worst symptoms are down there. And it's not uncommon that people impacted by MS can develop difficulties with bowel, bladder, and sexual function. The next several questions relate to down there. Brad asks, Is trouble emptying your bladder on the first try a precursor to incontinence? Brad, not necessarily. When people have difficulties with bladder and MS, it typically takes one of two forms. They either have a tight little spastic racquetball sized bladder that can barely hold half a Coca-Cola and then they have to run to the bathroom. And they can experience things like urgency, gotta go right now, frequency going way too often, and they can have accidents because they can't make it in time. There's a different problem where the bladder is of normal size and maybe it's even a bit bigger but the outflow track is tight, and so it's hard to get the urine out. And that's a different set of symptoms. People can feel that they don't adequately empty their bladder. They can have what we call bladder hesitancy. They can have double voiding, where they go to the bathroom, stand up, and then have to sit back down. And sometimes if the bladder fills up enough with urine, you can have stress incontinence. If you have trouble emptying your bladder, I wouldn't worry that the next thing that's going to happen is that you're going to be incontinent. But I would bring it up to your MS provider. Why? Because there's a lot of awesome treatments that can ameliorate that problem and make it better. You can even work with a urologist if necessary. Talk to your MS provider and get some treatment so that you don't have difficulty emptying your bladder. Thanks for the question, Brad. Here I'm talking about bladder pills, and Cheryl asks an appropriate question. Don't bladder pills cause dementia? The most common type of bladder pill is an anticholinergic. These are medicines like Ditropan and Detrol. And it's true that one of the side effects can be cognitive impairment. Now, that doesn't mean that every person that takes the pill is going to have cognitive impairment, but it's something that we want to be aware of. And if a person impacted by MS is having 
uh, difficulty with thinking and memory, and they're on one of these bladder pills, we have to consider whether or not it might be contributing. This is particularly true in patients that are a bit older in age. Of all the bladder pills available, my fave is Sanctura because it has the least amount of cognitive side effects. Again, if you're on one of these pills, it doesn't mean you're doomed to have dementia. It's one of the side effects that we have to keep in mind. Thanks for the question. Zach writes in, Hi, Dr. Boster. I had a question about erectile dysfunction. I've had some trouble here and there, and I'm only 23 years old. Any tips? Zach, you're not alone. And it's not uncommon that some people with MS can develop difficulties with sexual function. I have several videos on this channel where I give tips and tricks on how to improve your sex game. And I want you to watch those videos. I'll throw a link up above so you can click on it, and I'll make sure to include a link in the description down below. Even so, it is well asks, always ask myself, is it MS or menopause? And Cheryl writes, have you done an MS and menopause video? Thank you for the questions, guys. And yes, I do have a video that I've made on MS and menopause. So I'll throw a link up there in case you want to check it out. As you might expect, when women enter into menopause, there can be an uptick in MS symptoms. This doesn't mean that we're doomed when we go through menopause. It just means that we need to be on point and we may need to be more aggressive about managing MS symptoms during this transitional period. In a recent live stream, I talked about symptoms that can really lead to bad outcomes, even fatal outcomes in MS. Two of them were decubitus ulcers or bed sores and difficulties with swallowing. People who are wheelchair bound or bed bound need to have dependent areas of their body examined daily, their tush, their shoulder blades, their heels, because pressure on those areas can cause sores. And those sores, if unchecked, can lead to serious infections. Similarly, if you have difficulty swallowing and you're swallowing down the wrong tube, you can develop aspiration pneumonia. These are very serious things that we want to be looking for and I ask patients about almost every clinic visit. Erica wrote in and said the following, As a bedbound quadriplegic, thank you for addressing this. My caregivers have to watch my skin closely. My swallowing difficulties have increased recently. It's scary. Erica, I love hearing that your caregivers are on point and that they're watching your skin. And I certainly hope that if need be that you'll meet with a speech pathologist to have proper swallowing studies to keep you safe. We can all do good by remembering these things. By the way, the third scary symptom is urinary retention. We want to always be on the lookout for decubitus ulcers or bed sores, difficulty with swallowing and risk of aspiration pneumonia, and urinary retention, which can lead to urosepsis. Thanks, guys. Elizabeth Bromley writes, I'm socially isolated, definitely. Elizabeth, social isolation is a major issue in MS, and it can certainly worsen depression. And I think that we have to be super proactive and seek out ways to combat social isolation. There's a myriad of things that we can do. Getting involved in volunteering, getting involved in support groups, even going down to the local coffee shop just to sit and have a coffee and be around other people. I think that another way of combating that is joining online communities like this one. This is a call to action. If you're watching this video, please share with me in the comments section a trick or a tip or a technique that you've used to combat social isolation. Together, we can beat this. What questions still go unanswered? Leave your questions about MS symptoms in the comments section below. I look forward to reading them, and I'll answer them in an upcoming live stream or video, just like this one. My name's Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. If you'd like to up your game and learn more about MS, check out this playlist right there. YouTube Analytics thinks that you would adore this video right there. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Just click the circle with my face. Go ahead, click my face. Until my next live stream or my next video, this is Aaron Boster saying take care.